to the headquarters of the United Nations at Lake Success, news first came of the unprovoked assault upon the Republic of Korea, reprisals followed swiftly. Reprisals not merely in words, but in the courageous resistance of United Nations forces, fighting stubbornly for every yard, for every village. The GI delivered his own kind of reprisal, in bullets that could not be vetoed, in the heavy guns of UN naval forces brought quickly to Korean waters, in the roar of American fighting planes dominating the skies. Yet our men, as representatives of the United Nations, utilizing devices such as this giant airborne loudspeaker, neglected no opportunity to bring to the ears of the North Koreans the true story of their communist masters and the determined opposition of the free nations of the world. Broadcasting from an Air Force plane high in the sky, the voice of the UN offered the individual enemy fair and humane treatment under the rules of prisoners of war. Answering this offer, a few of the enemy surrendered, but for our own infantrymen in the front lines, it remained always a grim war waged in a rugged terrain, slugging it out 24 hours a day, yard for yard. To these men, harassed by enemy fire, there was no sight more welcome and no sound sweeter than the roar of American planes flashing across the sky. The ground soldiers should and must have constant close support from the air. It is the mission of the Tactical Air Command of the United States Air Force to see that he gets it. To achieve this in the Korean conflict, Military leaders had gone into action in a matter of minutes following the outbreak of hostilities, mapping out plans for the optimum use of tactical air power in the battle ahead. Decisions were made on the spot. Requirements and operations determined quickly in cooperation with the surface forces. To airfields destroyed by enemy action or through the necessity of sudden retreat, to runways pocked with bomb craters, engineers went to work immediately. Fighters operating from Japan were shifted to within easy range of the fighting front. And in short order, our squadrons of American jets were roaring off the runways to perform the first job of tactical air, namely to challenge enemy planes in the skies and secure and maintain air superiority. Fighters of the tactical air team, when unmolested by aerial opposition, turn their full attention to close cooperation with and support to the surface forces in taking and holding aggressor territory. Moving in at the behest of such tactical considerations, our fighters take as their targets supply depots, troop billets, warehouses, bridges, tanks, ships, in short, any target of opportunity or any pre-assigned target of military significance. Certain jets, unarmed but equipped with high-powered cameras, serve as reconnaissance planes and return daily from photographic missions far into enemy territory. These intelligence photos, invaluable for disclosing the disposition of enemy strength, are hurried to the lab and processed immediately for the next briefing. Here is photo murals that are used by the briefing officer to outline a mission for B-26 tactical bombers. Primary targets are railway centers, roads and bridges, supply depots, and other key installations. The B-26 is a standard light attack bomber of versatile use. It carries a bomb load of 5,000 pounds and is capable of mounting more than eight machine guns 
and 14 rockets. <laughs>